Thanks much for the nice introduction, Tavi. And uh, there's actually a real connecting component here because Tavi works on Svalbard and somehow Svalbard had been this missing piece in the glaciers I had a chance to work on until we found this search of Negribrien in 2017. And we had a chance to take data there. And then actually we were able to conduct the ISA2 validation campaign over Negribrien. So, all right, let's move on to the center of this talk here. The talk's co-authored by Tom Trano, Matt Lawson, Adam Hayes, and Jack Hesburgh. What now? And here we go. So the talk focuses on smaller and larger um, lasers. The small laser you see in the middle here being operated from an aircraft. That's a small laser system we fly ourselves over glacier areas and the large laser is of course NASA's ISA-2. We'll talk about Negribrien during search in 2017 to now and then about a new data processing method called the DDA-ICE which is used to analyze ISA-2 surfaces and then we move on to some of the validation campaigns and in the end we look at the actual changes in Negribrien which we can find out using these data products. Lots of people to thank, of course the ISA2 project, then all those folks at SIOS and Svalbard and at UNIS and NPI and so forth. Next slide. Oh, here's a slide. So this is just sort of an abstract kind of boring. What's interesting is the search of Negribrien actually shows that mass loss from a single Arctic glacier can equal 1% of global annual sea level rise. So that's actually quite a bit. Here is kind of a summary of the capabilities of the DDA for NASA's ISA-2 and for studying search type glaciers and other types of accelerations. So in the left, we see the Bering Glacier system in Alaska during search in 2011. In the center, we see Negribri and obviously the fast moving ices on the right and the slow moving ices on the left. And Jakob Saven, always a good example to compare against. And we can see that we have Karas provinces. So these on the left, they are Karasses from Jakob Saven. And on the right, they are crevasses from Nikibrien and their search crevasses. And they look totally different in imagery and they also look different in ISA2 data. So now we spend some more slides showing you how we actually get there. Okay, first some um, eye candy, I suppose. Here is Nikibrien on a beautiful day. You clearly see where the action is. The glacier accelerated to something like 21 meters per day from the usual. 30 centimeters that such a Svalbard glacier flows. Here's a bit of a summary. The interesting thing about the search of the Negribrien glacier system is it's one of the largest glacier system in Svalbard and the search occurs only every 86 years. It was found by Strozzi looking at Sentinel data. It last searched in 1935. So low hanging fruit here because there is no modern analysis of the search dynamics nothing that actually uses satellite data or anything the likes. It's currently, currently being 2017, the fastest moving glacier in Svalbard at 22 meters per day during peak times of acceleration. It slowed down a bit meanwhile, but such a Svalbard search keeps going for its five to seven years. And of course, we've been there every year until the pandemic stopped us from going there. The search phenomenon for those who are not big search study fans, the glacial acceleration is one of the two major sources of uncertainty in sea level rise assessment as said in the fifth AR of the IPCC. And surging is the least understood type of acceleration just mostly because the surges occur moderately often. So now if you're looking a bit closer at the search types, there's a much cited paper by Tabby and others, there is actually more than one search mechanism. And part of our project is to compare a search in the Bering Bay Glacier System in Alaska, which we've studied when it happened in 2011 to 2013-14. Bering Glacier is a temperate glacier versus 
Necribrian is a polythermal Arctic glacier, so there is quite a bit of difference in the uh, dynamics of the Arctic glacier. Also, there are small differences or like, let's say, less studied differences in the actual geology of the bed and the bed plays a considerable role in the sliding of the glacier over the bed. Bering terminates in proglacial lakes versus Necribrian, the fjord glacier. You'll see later it shovels all these all the masters out into the ocean right away through carving. So I was too lazy to put a list of references in here. A lot of people have worked on Svalbard searches, including Esther Hiscott, Adrian Luckmann, and Jack Kohler, and so forth. And the Bering Glacier search mechanism was actually the objective of Tom Trano's thesis, who combined mod uh, modeling and data analysis there. Okay, so here is a typical slide of the Bering Glacier system. The Bering Glacier system is a lot bigger than the Necribrian Glacier system, stretching about 200 kilometers to the Canadian border. And you see, so we take a crevasse-centered approach to the whole show, rather than a velocity-centered approach, which isn't to say velocity is unimportant, because after all, it's an acceleration. You do see different types of crevasse shapes, just sort of keep an eye on that as we move through the slides. Here's a sort of oldish slide of Jakobshavens Ispre in Greenland. And now we have a few more slides of Nikri And what I want to point out is actually you see that there is not just a mess of crevasses, but crevasses which are close to each other, like sort of hope you can see the cursor, tend to have the same shape and so you can actually define what I call a crevasse province, which is a area that's maximal with respect to spatial structure. And that's what we'll use in the very end. Here you see the famous folded moraines going back to Austin Post, who first said that shows you that we have a search glacier system and they're formed by the switch in equilibrium between a flow moving side glacier and the search glacier. Here are some totally classic crevasses which just opened as the search expands into the upper Necribrian. Okay, so now we've had enough of these full screen slides. So here in 2017, we see different crevasse types, let's just say. And here we have some in 2019 which show you the ice falls in the Filchner of Fenna where the surge expanded a bit and so forth. Okay, so now here are velocity maps made from Sentinel. These ones are made by Tom Trano, but we are working also with Adrian Luckmann on more general, where he takes a different approach to making these velocity maps. Ours try to capture sort of events while his are uh, more systematic. Regardless, you see the acceleration starting here and then expanding further into the Nikiprian glacier system while the overall velocity subsides a bit. So the highest velocities are 22 meters in 2017 and then the surge keeps affecting more area while getting slower overall. Yeah, more velocity maps from more recent times. So in the last ones you see now pretty much the entire main Necribrian is accelerating and it affects a part of low, lower Ordnanzbrien. That's Ordnanzbrien, that's Necribrien. This is transparent, uh, Academica Brien, transparent Brien, which are the inflows. We have used a, an older classification system based on worldview data. So that's a worldview image as taken, right? So then in the next, on, in the right slide, you see it's rotated to the side. Here you see the start of the search in 2016. So a bit of a pointer. You can do a lot with the imagery, but it takes us almost two years to get the actual images. So it's nothing like near time. Whereas I saw two data, you can now get three months after they've been collected and we're working on rapids. So I wanted to show these movies, but I think we have enough glaciology to show not these ancient movies about ISA 2. ISA 2 is an advanced topographic laser altimeter system, 
launched over three years ago by now. It's a multi-beam micropulse photon counting laser altimeter system. So while that may be a mouthful in essence, it means that rather than something like ERS-1 or GeoSat or ISAT, we do not have a single pulse which then gets integrated. Instead, we have swarms of little micropulses which rapidly hit the earth and we are recording photons, e events from every single photon that gets back to the sensor. So that's a lot of photons, especially during daytime. The sensor operates at 532 and so forth. Interestingly, it has, it's a multi-beam sensor, so it has three sets of strong beams and three sets of weak beams, and so forth. So now, looking at what we can get out of the data, for instance, here is a look at actually Nikribrian during search surfaces. And you can see, doing some fancy mathematics, we are able to detect surface height in crevassed glaciers at two and a half meter spacing, which is a really high spacing. And then so the top slide shows an example of the strong beam and the bottom shows the weak beam. Now you wouldn't expect to see exactly the same crevasses because due to the ISA2 sensor geometry, the weak beam is offset by 90 meters and it's also a bit behind or before depending on attitude of the observatory. So you just see it's the same type of glasses and we can do one-on-one -on -one comparisons. Okay, so now here's a little bit of algorithm math just so the modelers don't think. Only the modelers know how to make complicated mathematics while data analysis is generally limited to the histogram, the standard deviation in the second order derivative. So the point is we have a totally new observation technology and typically the math crowd lags behind the engineering crowd quite a bit. And so here's the effort at catching up. The classic approach to altimetry is doing waveform data analysis but we are looking actually at the field of photons. So now anyone can see why the surface must be there and any old algorithm is able to find the surface in such a field. However, if there are crevasses, it's not as easy as that. Okay, so now what we're doing is we find the signal slab and the noise slab and we throw away the rest and then we use something like the statistical distribution in the green, which contains the signal and the background characteristics which is above it then we use something that's called the radial basis function and that we use to calculate a density field so what's the radial basis function if you're not a fan of this math stuff right you can just assume the radial basis function used here is actually loaned from neural networks so it is like an activation function for a neural network but it's calculated directly. So that makes it run fast, fast enough for signal detection for the entire green and ice sheet and so forth. And then the next trick is we don't want to sit there and babysit all the cases that can occur. And while the sensor goes from daytime to nighttime and nighttime to daytime and cloudy environments and non-cloudy environments, and we perhaps have to look through trees or whatnot, we make the algorithm auto-adaptive, which means it, we now take density as created before, blow it up into a new dimension and create an auto-adaptive function. And that tells us which ones are the good photons and which ones are the junk photons. And that's then applied to sort the photons into their classes. And then we have a ground follower. The ground follower adapts automatically to surface roughness. So for instance, here's some, so the previous examples were from a validation campaign prior to launch using simple data from an instrument by David Harding and Phil Dupney, but now here actual ISA2 data, which is from a paper we published last year. So you can see all the steps in the end, you have the crevassed surfaces. So that you don't think this only works for crevassed surfaces, it does work without Further ado also for smooth ice surfaces. And the algorithm decides itself whether it's over crevasses or not and changes its parameters. 
So in summary, the DDA solves surface heights nominally at the 70 centimeter long track resolution of the sensor and the official NASA product, which is at load six for anyone who's worked with us, resolves surface height at 40 meters. Then we also have higher order products, which we can see later that actually lets you find crevasses under snow or um, things like water on ice and so forth. We are, we'll see this later, we are planning on sharing everything and so forth. Okay, so now, how do you know the sensor does what the sensor is supposed to do? You do fly a validation campaign and of course, thinking how complex a search glacier during search is, this provides us with an ideal environment to detect surface heights, saying, well, if we can find all the complex surfaces in the search glacier, then we can probably do well with an algorithm anywhere else. So here's a map of Nekribrien with all the ISAT 2 tracks. And then here's some high resolution SkySat imagery from Planet, which was acquired for our project. At the same time, the Norwegian Polar Institute was super helpful, letting us charter the helicopter for a few years in a row. We're flying a high resolution, small airborne laser. And then we use imagery, just the GoPro, and a bunch of ancillary data to make sure we actually know where we're pointing on the ground. We also take students into the field, one new lucky undergraduate every year. This is Connor setting up the base station. So now back to some of the science. When the laser was first launched, it was of course winter and we'd been there in summer. So we're zooming in on the data and I see these things below the surface, which is of course now the glaciers covered in feet of snow we see crevasses. And what looks like crevasses actually must be crevasses from the previous summer. So we quickly whipped up a level two algorithm, which lets us find the first order surface and then the second order surface. So now we actually have a tool to study search behavior going through the winter when we actually can't see the ice surface. I sent this to science, but alas, it almost only made it and not really. Okay, so then we compare to uh, airborne geophysical data. So you can, in essence, see it sort of matches. It's not supposed to match directly because the airborne laser flies 905 nanometer data, which has a different interaction with what I call the cryophages, like snow, fern, and so forth. So and it penetrates differently than the five. 32. So you see crevasse depth is a little bit off and spacing, but it's actually pretty close, given that we have several months in between and the glaciers moving and all this. Okay, here just a bunch of results from the validation campaign. Here, so now looking closer at the validation, ISA2 has this somewhat complex beam geometry, which we've unraveled in a paper together with Tony Martino and Tom Newman of the ISA2 project. So I'm a member of the science team, which now explains our stuff gets funded for implementing mostly the DDAIs and a classification based on it. And so what you need to know about this here is you want to make sure that you're actually really close to the track while you fly a helicopter and you need to put this all into the prediction of where the ground location is supposed to do, just to say it's not entirely trivial to figure this out. We do wind up being really close, close being something like within approximately 20 meters between the ground track of Atlas and the helicopter tracks. That's actually a real compliment for the pilots who are able to fly this close to a predefined track, considering weather and that such a little helicopter shakes around in the wind. We have also crossover analysis conducted and so forth. So the take home message is it's all pretty good. And we can use this setup from small instrumentation on a small aircraft in manned mode and use this for SR2 validation. What we also see, so here is 
ULS, our laser, and ISA2, the Kavasis sort of match, considering the difference in frequency of the instrumentation. And if we go several steps down the road towards the data analysis, we can see that Kavast provinces are rougher than non Kavast provinces. And this matches between the flight tracks and the ISA2 tracks. Okay, so now we are coming, this is the same slide I showed in the beginning. Now I hope people can understand it a bit better. We see different types, actually it's a different slide. Anyways, we see different types of interactions of the ISA2 sensor with the environment. So we can see water in crevasses and the glaciologists know that water changes in the hydrological system of the glacier play a big role in understanding how the surge evolves. Of course, the usually efficient drainage system gets blocked eventually, but other than in Barclay Camp's papers, it's more of a transition rather than a switch between states. So ISA2 can help figure some of that out. Now for aficionados of analysis, the official product called ADL06 actually can't detect crevasses. So it's the blue lines and you see this mess, whereas DDAIs, even with the first layer, gets you all the crevasse details, which is why we're working on a research product soon to be launched for all of Greenland, which will show you the surface sites derived from the DDA. The DDA is also the official algorithm for atmospheric data analysis. And Adam Hayes is on here as a student in our group who significantly helped with the atmospheric data product and now works on ice characteristics as well. So a, sec a second advantage of the DDA is we can do two layer analysis. So for the snow covered crevasses, we found the surface and the bottom. And of course, Adel 06 has no capacity for this feature. When I wrote a paper on this, some reviewer asked me to make detailed comparisons between ADL-03, ADL-06 and DDA. So these are sort of in the talk here, but I admit they may be too complicated. One can say the density field actually plays a big role in the ability of our algorithm to detect high resolution surfaces. So that's sort of the density field while the ADL-03 beam characterization has to switch between either strong or weak or likely or unlikely and that already screws it up well in complicated cases so there are simple cases and there are more complicated cases daytime data higher background makes it even worse for non-auto adaptive algorithms and and so forth All right so now you see how dda picks up signals in the weak and strong beam and the standard product doesn't even have high confidence classified photons. That's what that says. Okay, so now we're getting to more of the glaciological part. So now we're going to look at what we can learn about surges and other types of acceleration. This is the repeat slide from the beginning. Let's take a quick look at Jakobshaven. So the repeated action of always the same force, but that being a complex force on the ice surface yields these really complex crevasse patterns. And we can see that ISA2 is actually able to pick these all up. This is just the pattern of Planet. Planet is a small sat, a commercial small satellite. And I help with the evaluation of the small set data. So now those are all being open source, open science, like anything NASA does. And you can download the small set data and look at them. The small set data are these really high resolution images at 50, 70 centimeters. And you can actually take your time and stare at this and figure out that every shoulder you find in the ISA2 data is actually a little shoulder identifiable in the images. Isn't this wonderful? And you can spend hours and hours looking at these. Now we don't want to spend hours looking at this forever after we've done it once. So we're moving now to a characterization and classification of the different types of deformation as 
encompassed in the ISO2 data. And Adam is going to work on that. He has a first little paper in the making. Here is the classic map one would make from of a glacier during search. So first you make an elevation map. And we can make elevation maps every three months makes kind of sense as an optimum between glacial change and how much data do you actually need for a map. Tom Trano has gone in and analyzed all the 200 granules ever collected between the start of 2019 and the end of 2020. The next product we derive is a map of surface roughness. So we also have surface roughness maps of the Greenland ice sheet by now. And the surface roughness map shows you that indeed the crevassed areas as shown in the underlying Landsat 8 image are following this red here. The parameter is the same pond parameter I've been using forever. So I stopped putting the geostatistical formula in. It is something you derive from calculating vario functions and it's related to the localized standard deviation. And then higher order parameters are sort of more complicated. Next, if you want to take a bit of a closer look, then you can look at one year elevation changes across. So RGTs are the reference count tracks. What we figure out here is despite of the surface being crevassed, we can actually calculate the typical drop of the surface. And so we can have results at two scales from the same data track. So the first one, the first result shows you the crevasse spacing. And you can see that typically the crevasses get a little bit wider spaced. The depth gets a little bit shallower both the mean and the maximum depth. So that's all sort of typical for ISA2, uh, for search type glaciers. Once the crevasses form, they widen a bit and they get shallower, but they form in a single event. This little inset always shows you where we are on the glacier. And we also have to take into account that one tracks a little bit like 20 meters upstream of the next track of the next year's track. Now, here's a bit more of a glaciologically interesting result. If we extend this, it's the same track we just saw, right? But now we take a look under a different analysis eye, so to speak. So we can see that at the edge, the surface heights are actually the same. And in the middle, there is this drop of surface side. So that means it's not a climatic effect of the glacier using losing mass. It must be a dynamic effect of a surface elevation change that's a result of the surge. And here we have this crevasse field. So overall, this must be the bulge where the glacier gets out of instability and that initiates part of the surge. Okay, if we take a more regional view as opposed to a track wide view, we can analyze the surface height rate of change as in this image here. So how did, how were these made? One takes all the tracks that were captured, but then of course you need to throw away the tracks that are impeded by clouds or sometimes ISA2 has to do the so-called ocean scans which and so forth. So you're losing some of the interval time intervals. And so then the rate of change is adjusted for the actual time interval observed for each reference count track and then plotted out. Now what you can see here is mass loss in the upper glacier is on the order of 10 to maximally 20 meter, uh, 20, 30 meters along the edges where you have drawdowns. And you can see that mass gets transferred to the front, not so much in an increase in elevation, but in less of a decrease. Because after all, it's a fjord glacier, so there is heavy carving, as you saw initially in these photographs. OK. 
Okay, next. So now back to looking at other individual little processes which happen locally in the glacier. So another question we looked at is, is the entire glacier system surging or is it not? Because in 1935, some side glaciers were affected, but so far we can see that Ordnanspreen actually accelerates as we see in the velocity maps, but looking at the height changes and the imagery, we can tell that it's a secondary effect because you lose mass close to Nikribrin and then that creates a mass deficit which leads to rotation of certain parts of the lower Ordnanspreen ice and then that calves off and then more ice wants to fill this gap. So it's an acceleration, but it doesn't have a dynamic core in the side glacier. It's just the Nikribrin effect. We can also see little crevasses form. I apologize, the lines are a little bit thin, so I let the slide sit there a little longer. You can figure out actually from these time tracks when new crevasses occurred in certain areas of Upper Negribrien in this case. So ISA 2 repeats every 91 days. So you can do repeat tracks over the same reference ground track, and that's what these slides here show. So in later, the later ones are the lower ones because remember the glacier loses height. Okay, so then we see more crevasses show up in areas where there weren't any in earlier parts of the search. Okay, next. Then we can study the surface lowering. This is sort of what I said before, but before we had just two tracks, so now we have a whole swarm of tracks. And you can follow the mass loss from July 2019. Notably, this analysis includes strong beams and weak beams to January 2020 and then April 2020. And close scrutiny of these plots or making differences in time series shows you that the surface lowering actually is almost non-existent between January and April. So it still lowers a little bit, but as common sense might make you expect, the bulk of the surface lowering occurs outside of the months of January to April and more in the summer and fall months. This you get out of like one is the weak beam analysis, and while one is the left beam and one is the right beam. And so then the ISA2 observatory rotates every six months. So the position of GT1L is always left, but sometimes it's surveyed with a weak one and sometimes with a strong one. So a particular achievement of Tom's data analysis here is that we are able to compare results from the weak beams and results from the strong beams, despite the fact that the weak beams contrast a lot weaker against the background. So a lot of analysis you'll find on ISA2 data actually ignore the weak beams altogether, but we can use them here. And that makes it actually that we have twice as much data and Yeah, much more, many more data sets to compare. The next thing we noticed is there is a wide rift forming along the medial moraine with Academica Brain here. And that's here's the medial moraine. And then looking at these data here, you see this rift develop as an area where you have two different dynamic provinces. And this is something we actually observed for Bering Glacier as well. Okay, next we are coming to the higher order product, which is surface roughness. And before we had a roughness map, just as such as a time shot. And here we have now a compilation of roughness rate of change using the same pond parameter, but made as a residual parameter. So then it picks up smaller changes and is not affected by general height change as much as if you'd use the general pond parameter. 
Now you can see that the areas where the grass fields are, which is here where our examples were from, and some areas in the ice fall, and mostly the areas where the large grass fields are show the biggest rate of change. Now a little bit stepping backward in why do we make parameters to study things. So roughness rate of change, of course, relates directly to crevassing and it has the advantage of being a single parameter that can be calculated forward using masses of data and it doesn't need something like a supervised classification. So it tells you certain things, but it's not as accurate as if you were to do a supervised classification of a similar phenomenon. So now in contrast, if you really want to know, okay, which crevasse type developed where, you want to take a different approach. And here are some results from a classification. So that's a totally different software approach we are taking. You see now little fields of color and the fields of color correspond to different types of crevasse provinces. The white outline is where we have imagery. This is worldview image data, which have a spatial resolution of, depending on the worldview generation, 70 centimeters to 50 centimeters. We run this over the panchromatic channel, which is the highest resolution channel. And well, the first, so now, we're using what's called the connectionist statistical classification method, which is a neural network that uses two statistical parameters as input and then trains on vectors of these parameters. And what's new about this whole thing is that Jack Hasberg, who recently graduated, he's about to graduate, thesis says January 2022. I just sort of put this there. So Jack has implemented a combination between the old classification method, which is the 20 year old neural network I've made with a previous student, and then a more modern approach to neural networks, which is a convolutional neural network. And you can actually figure out that so deep learning is sort of the new buzzword and everyone wants to use deep learning because apparently you can tell pizza slice from African elephant from bicycle. However, no one's really looked at complex questions in earth sciences such as crevasse shapes. Turns out if you have a semi-low number, something like a training set of 3000 images, of 3000 sub images of the big images, the old method still outperforms with being able to correctly associate deformation classes, which is what the crevasse classes are. But once you have hundreds of thousands of training images, you can use deep learning. So what you want to do or what Jack actually did is you start your neural network with the connection is to statistical variogram based method. And then you pipe that into the convolutional neural network and that gets you the best results. Now back to the glaciology, you can actually see, so this is the 2016 image. So we've selected May images here. 2016 image shows the search just starting, then 17, that was the year we had the biggest acceleration. So we see one directional crevasses always head up the expansion of the search their furthest up glacier. That's what you saw in the initial photographs. And then, of course, you have shear along the sides and you have multi-directional crevasses in the middle and simply chaos class in the front. Who wants to classify that? And there's a whole time series of that, which Jack turned into this little movie and I don't have the software for it. So. Anyways, we, Jack has a whole time series of this. So then all together, you can actually characterize the evolution of the search using this collection of tools we have. The new, this, this new tool, I should say, is funded by National Science Foundation Office of Advanced Cyber Infrastructure together with Arctic Natural Research, which realized that some people have 
fancy software which others would like to use, but it's sort of too complicated math behind it. So we are releasing this as a cyber infrastructure as soon as Jack has the thesis in the first paper wrapped up. And then anyone can play with this. The software is actually really easy to use and it takes any images now. You can run any type of neural network. These are just two kinds and so forth. Okay, now if you didn't like the talk, you won't like reading all these papers. Everything we do has to be open source, open science. Of course, the ISA2 data are available on Earth data. A lot of people have used them. We will release the DDA ice results as soon as we have the Greenland and Arctic ice sheets ready and combined with our new atmospheric ground flag. Then we'll hold online products for those of you who want to learn how to use the high resolution data and the surface we promised the Svalbard folks to make a special Svalbard product. The field data are available online if you wish to share those and you can read it up on the algorithms here. I think that's it. Thank you very much for listening. I think we have plenty of time to for questions. I hope there are questions. Thank you all for joining. So yeah, uh, thank you very much for a fantastic seminar. So what we usually do with uh, questions is we ask people to just indicate in the chat that they have a question and we get, um, then we then ask people to unmute. I'll also have a look on Facebook to see if there's any questions on there. Okay. So, so I have the chat field open now. Do you want me to stop share or maybe I should leave it open? I see uh, all the people on the side. So I think if one of you speaks, you pop to the front. Is that right? Olga, do you want to ask your questions? You should be able to unmute yourself. And yes, as soon as somebody speaks, they ought to pop up to near the top. Um, Thank you so much, Ulla. Um, I was wondering why is the depth of the crevasses that you see, is it the minimal depth or is it an actual depth? Is it like something that laser can, yeah, that's still number of photons, right? So if it would be very deep crevasse, but very narrow, then the number of returned photons would be much, much smaller. So is it the true depth of the crevasse or is it the tough what is visible for the laser? Thank you. That's, yeah, that, Olga, that's actually one of the key questions we have with the validation campaign. So here is a slide. That's why we actually fly a laser of a similar but different frequency. And so if you, do you see the slide now before I just sort of roll over it? Yeah. So yeah. this is one, so you can see here, right? You have some photons that extend below the crevasses. So we have been a bit conservative with making the crevasse depth end at this depth because that's actually where you see these density centers, which I think are caused by fern and slush, which has fallen into the crevasse. So that is a first responding surface in the 532 sensor. If we look at the 950, we do get similar crevasse steps as this table here shows. So it's not totally the same just because the ULS at 5.30 responds different to what's called, uh, at 9.50, it responds different to what's called the red-green problem of different penetration. And in the paper on the simple data, actually, which is the last paper, we have a comparison of penetration into fern. So that offsets the depth a little bit between 5.32 and 10.64. But so based on this comparison to the, to the airborne LIDAR data, we have set the parameters of the DDA such that it sort of matches. So between these two sensors, we think we have the crevasse depth correctly. And then some of these single photons here, they can be forward scattered in time. So they may not be that's sort of more understanding the sensor 
a bit better. But yes, that is a key question. So I hope we have the cover steps as good as we can. Oh, obviously, you can't have someone hold a stick into a 30 meter deep crevasse. Some crevasses are actually deeper than the 60 meter we see here. Okay, someone else has a question. Roger, I think, has a question. Roger Clark has a question. Tabby, yeah. you have to help me out when new people ask new questions because it's hard to speak and keep an eye on the chat, although I have it open. That's okay. Roger, go ahead ask, and ask your question. Okay, thank you very much, Uta. That was really enjoyable. Thank, thank, thanks a lot. I, I think Olga actually got the best question there, but what, what uh, your presentation made me think about, uh, as well as awkward things to ask students like Fresnel zones and things like that, was about the sides of the crevasses, because I'm sure in previous seminars, you know, forgive me, I'm a seismologist, but uh, in previous seminars, we've heard about the mechanics of crevasses opening. And do you think these fantastic new data have any, anything to say about the, the shapes of the sides of the crevasses at all? Yeah, I think so, because um, if you blow up in the crevasses, sometimes you can actually find, like see in this one, you can, well, where's a better slide for this? You get some, of course, limited information on that's the first slide on the shape of crevasses. You have to be a bit lucky whether you have reflections off of the side of the crevasse. I think, see like in these ones from Jakobshaven, okay, you definitely see photons that follow the sides of the crevasse. Now Jakobshaven has really wide crevasses. So of course you can pick up reflections from the edge. Definitely you can see these secondary steps in the crevasse, whereas the search crevasses, now this is one with secondary, with, which tries to catch the water as well. So that's kind of harder to look at. You do have really sharp edges where the crevasse is open. So we've made a parameter called crevasse edge roundedness, which we describe in a different paper. So you can learn a bit about the constraints of say crevasse opening mechanics right so there is some clues it's not like entirely obvious but so we're trying to write a paper now that says okay here are the characteristics of crevasses generated by constant flow compared to crevasses generated by a single time opening event like the search crevasses and that of course must be based on the types of photons you can identify as signal photons. We're not quite sure how to go about this. I said to Adam, write a simple paper so people get this at all. Maybe someone like you would like a more complicated paper right away, which tells us all the details. <laughs> Thank, thanks very much. That was fantastic. Andre, uh, do you want to unmute yourself and ask a question? Okay, I can read the question. Andre is asking the question that comes from the heart of my science. Will DDS algorithm be used to produce a standard product among the family of products already available? Yes, as soon as, I, as, soon as enough community members knock on the door of the project and write to the ISA2 project, Tom Newman, Nathan Kurtz and so forth, we want DDA, we want DDA, then the project will be able to implement it, I hope. So the, the process for implementation of a new product is as follows. And I can say this because I actually write the Atl09 atmospheric data product which is one man's noise is another man's data for any glaciologist because when you see the clouds, you do not see the surface. But so we first create an algorithm that then has to be accepted by the project. And then the project has to fund me to actually help NASA ASAS, which is the core group. So NASA owns all the algorithms. They are open source and described in what's called an algorithm theoretical base document, something like 400 pages where the algorithm is described at nauseum. And we help them implement this as a product. 
And so this process would still have to happen for ADL03. So under the science team project, I can make what's called a research product and we're getting pretty close to releasing three months of Greenland ice sheet DDA surface products made on the NASA cloud. And then people can all use this, but that's sort of different than it being a standard product because the advantage of the standard product is they're being cranked by ASAS and ASAS has way more compute power than the, dumb, than the wonderful little NASA cloud, but it just doesn't have the capacity. And so I would be happy to make, um, to implement such a product. So definitely, I mean, if the more people want to use the high resolution product, the better the likelihood of it coming out. I mean, I have a research group like most of you do with just a few grad students and so forth. We can't make a product all the time. So it would be better actually if NASA did that. Roger has another question. Or I think, but it, it, it If there's a see what happens. So uh, we've done things like that for more than a handful of people from the community, and sometimes we find cool stuff and whatever. So a quick question for me then, from me then, uh, can you see water at the bottom of these uh, yes. in the data? Yeah. Yes, actually. So while we didn't look for water specifically, the slide which I still have up shows that we can capture the water. So we have, see like there is an algorithm called DDA ICE2, which runs sort of the algorithm twice. And then you can see secondary surfaces in it. And we also have something that we call the DDA ICE bifurcate, which we've used to map like melt ponds on the sea ice. And that actually works pretty well. A question is, do, how accurately do we get the water depth? And we may fly another validation campaign for that. But yes, we do see water because you see different characteristic densities. I can send you a slide with the ponds. There is no pond slide in this talk. And we are running out of time, but... So we let's might need to send you a pond slide, Tabby, because we have really good pond slides for the sea ice. We have some of 
ponds in the Jakob Savens drainage basin. So you can, we have this version of the algorithm that figures out whether it could get befuddled by a second surface. So this is DDA as two, which finds a secondary surface that's less prominent, but the bifurcate can already figure out, hey, we have top and bottom, we should follow both. Fantastic. We have a quick question from Paloma. Um, sorry if that's not how you pronounce your name. Do you want to unmute yourself? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, totally. Thanks. Uh, thanks a lot for the great presentation. I have a quick question, if you wouldn't mind repeating. I'm not sure if I didn't get it uh, myself. Uh, it's just, I'm just curious on the ice that, uh, I don't know if it's raw data. Uh, why is it so noisy? Is this something that one expects? Um, I think you, you mentioned something about this, if you could say again. Yes, yeah, yeah. It, so it is what one expects. When I sort of rushed, hustled over this ISA2 is a photon counting laser altimeter, see, right? And it's a micropulse altimeter. So the high resolution comes at a cost. And the cost is you register returns from every single photon. So in nighttime, there are, I mean, photon is just light, right? So during night, it's dark. And then the signal from the active sensor, which is the green light, has no real competition because it's dark. So you get really clear signals. If you look at this thing, which is a raw data from daytime, you see all these returns from photons in the atmosphere, right? If you look out of the window, it's light. That's all these other photons. So of course, we are not seeing all the photons, but we pick up any photon in the 532 nanometer slice of the atmosphere. Yes, and that, of course, makes the detection of what's actually the signal from the active sensor and what's all this background. So it's a mathematically ill-posed problem. And difference between DDA and the classic methods is we are using this new auto-adaptive mathematics to decide what's a good photon, what's a bad photon. Whereas ATL-06 and most of the other mathematical approaches use try to cast the ISA-2 data back to how ISAT-1 or even ERS-1 would respond, like they make big waveforms. But that comes then at the cost of spatial resolution. So we are trying to see, like the mathematicians are usually slower than the engineers. We are trying not to be this slow. And then, of course, the geo community needs to absorb if you have some new technology, some new math, is there actually something we can wrap our head around and use. But so, yes, we do see these. And we expect all these background photons. The trick is to throw them away. Tavi announces the next seminar, which tells me we must be, have filled the hour. <laughs> right? Um, thank you very much. Yes, thank you very much indeed. I, and I think we've finished, filled the hour and we've probably just about run out of questions. So um, yes, we have no seminar next week. Uh, and then the following week, um, they start weekly and we've got Nozumu Takuchi from uh, Japan talking about the dark side of glaciers, cryoconite. So uh, great title. Thank you very much for a fabulous talk and uh, hope to see you in two weeks time. Okay, thanks very much. I've enjoyed it. Great work. Thank you very Gary. much indeed. You won't need a TV subscription anymore. <laughs> Soon you'll have a talk every day of the week. <laughs> Happy New Year, everyone, and see you in a couple of weeks. Should we say Tabby got a prize? Magnus has to say this. <laughs> He already said it on Facebook, but thank you. <laughs> oh, Tavy gets to say these things, the important stuff. <laughs> see you in a couple of weeks, everybody. Happy right. New Year. Yeah, it's Cheers. fun to see Bye. everyone. Take care.